Hello again, Nick here, and we're going to continue on with Chapter 3 of The 21 Bloons by William Penn Dubois. And we're on Chapter 3, A Description of the Globe. There's Professor Sherman on his way to the Western American Explorers Club of San Francisco. Let's find out how that all goes. Chapter 3. The presidential train answered the cheer of welcome given to it by the people of San Francisco with a long, piercing toot. Then, pulling up to the station, it slowed down, panting and letting off steam, as would any engine that had just completed a cross-country run. The police department had detailed 100 officers to keep the station clear. These policemen interlocked their arms, forming a human chain which held the eager crowds back. The presidential train was shorter than usual for greater speed and was made up of only an engine, coal tender, dining car, and the president's own car, with the familiar observation and speech platform at the rear. The mayor had the carriage, which, uh, which was to take Professor Sherman to the Western American Explorers Club, pull up opposite the presidential coach. Uh, clapped his white-gloved hands twice, and instantly two porters appeared with a red carpet strip, which was rolled up like a huge jelly roll. He clapped his hands again, and the red carpet was rolled across the station platform from professors, from the professor's carriage to the president's coach. He clapped his hands again, and the official welcoming committee lined up on both sides of the carpet, wearing their small bowlers and polka dot ties. The mayor then reached in his vest pocket and took from there a small silver whistle, which he tooted once. He replaced the whistle, then followed by the chief surgeon of the San Francisco General Hospital, he was walked up the red carpet into the presidential train. The whistle toot was evidently the cue to start the music by the combined fire and police department bands, for instantly lovely strains of music were heard. As Professor Sherman, looking rather haggard and worn, descended from the train in, onto the red carpet platform with the mayor holding, up on, holding him up on one side and the chief surgeon holding him up on the other, a medley of three appropriate songs were heard, mingled with the tremendous cheers from the crowd. Here is that picture of the professor descending from the train. There's the chief surgeon and the little welcoming committee. These three songs that were played were selected by the mayor himself, were Oh, When I Walk... I Always Walk with Billy, Billy Boy, and Marching Through Georgia. It was thought afterwards by many that the slim connection between that last song and Professor Sherman was a bit far-fetched. Professor Sherman was assisted into the back seat of the carriage by the mayor, and, climbed in, and the mayor climbed in and sat beside him. The chief surgeon, acting as a sort of official footman, uh, sat next to the coachman, while instead of lackeys, two trained nurses sat on the raised seats behind, overlooking the professor. Here again is that picture of the setup. The carriage proceeded up the triumphant avenue from the station to the Explorers Club through thunderous cheers and showers of confetti. Just as the carriage pulled up in the front of the club, a sweet-looking, well-scrubbed little girl in a crisp white starched dress, an orphan from St. Catherine's Wave home, rushed up to the professor, curtsied politely, and presented him with a little bouquet of toy balloons. How thoughtful. The professor accepted the bouquet, thanked the little girl, and as the crowd sighed with approval, kissed her on both cheeks. He was then helped out of the carriage, helped up the stairs into the club, up the aisle, which parted the pactatorium in the middle, in the middle, onto the speaker's platform where a freshly made bed awaited him. Remember, this guy's sick. He's recovering. They, they pulled him out of his hospital bed to do this, so they want to make him comfortable. The professor sat on the bed as the chief surgeon removed his shoes. He then swung his feet around up on the bed as the chief surgeon covered his lap with a comforter. Then, facing the audience, propped up in bed by one bolster of four huge pot pillows, Professor Sh William Waterman Sherman was ready to tell his story. Are you ready to hear this? We've been waiting a couple chapters to hear the story. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to present Professor Sherman, announced the mayor. Mr. Mayor, fellow explorers, ladies and gentlemen, said Professor Sherman. A huge hush fell over the audience. There was a small creaking sound of people getting themselves comfortably set, and then silence. I am happy to be home again. At this, the audience rocked the building with cheers. Ah! The hubbub lasted four minutes before the crowd could settle down. Whew, wow, they're excited. I haven't been away very long, 
but I have certainly missed... The audience reminded by the remark that about the professor had clipped 40 days off the speed record for a trip around the world broke out in tumultuous applause. <laughs> this time it lasted five full minutes. The professor looked helplessly at the mayor, who immediately sensed how he felt. He faced the audience and silenced it and said, Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sherman has a, has a long and, we feel sure, interesting story to tell. He hasn't had a chance to say 20 words yet, and you have already interrupted him with 10 minutes of applause. The professor isn't running for president. He's recounting a scientific adventure to a scientific club. Kindly refrain from applauding hereafter until the president has concluded his story, thereby respecting the professor's story and his ill health. I thank you. The crowd responded to this by being absolutely quiet. Professor Sherman turned to the mayor, thanked him with a nod, and started again. It is funny that my trip has ended by being such a fast trip around the world. I find myself referred to now as one of the speediest travelers of all time. Speed wasn't at all what I had in mind when I started out. On the contrary, if all had gone the way I had hoped, I would still be happily floating in my balloon, drifting anywhere the wind cared to carry me, east, west, north, or south. It just happened, by some strange fate, that the wind blew me three-quarters around the world at tremendous speed, and my only moments of rest were once, were once when I crashed in the Pacific and again after a crash in the Atlantic. The other reason I took this trip was that I wanted to be alone, detached from the earth, in a balloon. But this didn't work out either. My trip wasn't half over when I found myself in a balloon contraption with 80 other people, men, women, and children. For years I had cherished the idea of this trip. As you know, I was a teacher of arithmetic for 40 years. 40 years of being surrounded by a classroom of healthy, prankish students. 40 years of spitballs. 40 years of glue on my seat. Sal hepatica in my inkwell, and other devilish tricks. Long after the 36th year, I started yearning to be alone. I amused myself with thinking of many ways of doing this. Trips in small boats, polar expeditions. I joined this explorers club, for after all, it seemed to me that the ambitions of explorers was to go where no one had gone before. One day I started thinking of a balloon in which I could float around of out of everybody's reach. This was the main idea behind my trip, to be where no one would bother me for perhaps one full year, away from all such boring things in the lives of teachers as daily schedules, having to be in different classrooms at exact times, week after week. I planned and worked on designs for my balloon in my spare time, using the experiments of other balloonists as a guide. I wanted a big balloon, one which could keep me in the air for a year or at least many months. Big balloons are a problem. Unless they're designed with great care, they're ripped to shreds by the wind while they're being inflated. Once a balloon is in the air, it offers little resistance to the wind and isn't bothered by it. But while it's tied down to the ground and being filled with hydrogen, it's at the wind's mercy. I followed the plans of the great French balloonist Giffard, whose captive balloon, the Clou, is the biggest balloon ever built. His balloon was constructed of seven alternating thicknesses of rubber and silk. I planned my balloon, which I christened The Globe, now we know the title of the, why the title of the chapter was that, with four alternating thicknesses, with four alternating thicknesses of rubber and silk. My balloon was 6,000 cubic yards in size, which is just about ten times the size of a standard balloon. The Globe was one of the biggest free balloons ever built. I wanted a big balloon for two reasons. First of all, as I've already said, to keep me in the air for a long time. My second reason was that I wanted a big basket to live in, and it would take a huge balloon to, live the, to lift the basket I had in mind. As you know, the standard balloon basket is just a little compartment big enough for two men to stand in or one man to sit in, and altogether impossible to sleep in. There is little room for provisions, and it would be impossible to live in a standard balloon basket for any length of time. This goes without saying. I looked to the work of another French balloonist named Nader, Nader built himself a big balloon, which he christened Gant, and attached to this a real little basket house. It had a door, windows, a staircase, which led up to its little roof. The roof of the house was bordered by a woven balustrade, furnished with wicker furniture, and was an ideal observation platform. The inside of the house was appropriate, appropriately and comfortably furnished. This was a basket weaver's masterpiece. 
It was light, strong, and comfortable. I designed my basket house in much the same manner, with a few, but with but few changes. I didn't use the roof of my wooden house as an observation platform, but rather as a sort of open-air attic in which to store food. For observation, there was a small porch all the way around my house, with light, upright balustrades made of bamboo. This porch was quite like the deck of a ship. Nader's balloon wasn't built, as mine was, with the idea of taking very long trips or staying in the air for many months. Look at this. This is pretty cool. Check that out. So that is the that is the house that Professor Sherman designed. I just would love to go up there. That's why I think this book is so interesting. Can you imagine? I think now you're probably wondering where the the movie Up that uh, Pixar made, where they got their idea from. This book came first. Um, so he was talking about again the Frenchman uh, Nader and how he had designed a similar house. Um, But he therefore didn't have to worry much about ballast. The way you take an ordinary trip in a balloon is quite simple. The balloon is tied down with several ropes while it's being filled with gas. When it is full, you give the command to cut the ropes and you fly off. The balloon will instantly leap into the air and carry you high up in the sky, the height depending on the amount of gas in the balloon and the amount of weight you are carrying. When you want to come down, you pull a rope which lets some of the gas out of the bag. If you want to climb higher, you must throw something overboard, which will make the balloon lighter. Nader carried bags of sand, which he threw overboard when he wanted to gain altitude. Sand is the usual ballast used by all balloonists. I couldn't afford to use sand as ballast because in order to stay up in the air and live comfortably for a long period of time, I had to make every ounce I carried with me count. I used food for ballast. I thought this to be ideal for a long trip, with food for ballast and... Every time I threw a pail of garbage overboard, I would go up a little higher. Thus, for every unnecessary sandbag, I could carry extra food to make my trip last longer. My balloon house was furnished with the lightest of everything. The usual mattress is too heavy and is only used at night anyway. I designed a mattress made of the same material as my balloon and filled with gas. With a sheet over it, it stayed on the floor and was most soft and comfortable. So, yeah, the the first kind of air bed, air mattress. Um, Remember, this is like in the 1800s that this happened. Uh, With the sheet over... When I pulled the sheet off, it floated up to the ceiling and was thus stored out of the way in the daytime. I had chairs and a table made of balsa wood and bamboo. I had a library of paper-bound books printed in small type. My foods and liquids were chosen with the idea of saving weight. I carried a strong shark fishing rod with the hope of catching a few fish to increase my food supply. That's his uh, fishing rod over some books that he had packed. Some balloonists who recently planned ocean voyages, such as the Americans John Wise and T.C. Lowe, attached lifeboats to their balloons in case of a crash in the water. I couldn't see carrying this extra weight. I had a tailor make me two waterproof suits out of balloon cloth and carried a cork lifesaver. If I crashed, I figured this type of suit would keep me dry and the lifesaver would keep me above water. These suits were wonderful. They were light, and being both waterproof and airtight, were extremely warm. I planned to wear one and wash the other by attaching it to my shark fishing rod and dunking it in the ocean. All of my laundry was done in this manner. That's kind of neat. The rest of my clothes were simply the lighter variety of everyday menswear. The Higgins Balloon Factory took a year to build my balloon, and I must say they did a fine job of it. It was finished August 10th of this year. I had one excellent trial flight in my balloon, in which I thought was enough, and it was a short flight and everything worked perfectly. The only mishap was that I broke every plate and glass in my woven house when I came down a little too fast. I corrected this by having silver plates made to replace dishes, and I used a silver cup instead of glasses. The plates and cups had small handles on them so I could tie them onto my fishing rod and wash them by dunking them in the ocean. I spent two days in outfitting my balloon with the proper provisions. I carried a small still for making fresh water out of salt water and a medium-sized keg of quinine tonic. I was soon set all I was soon all set for my trip. Higgins notified the press that I had intentions of taking a long trip in a giant balloon which might easily end up in being my fir- being the first to fly across the Pacific Ocean. The newspapers carried the story, giving it about half a column on the fourth page. The public wasn't at all interested in my trip then. 
I think it was because Higgins told the newspaper man that my balloon wasn't quite as big as Nader's. The public had heard of Nader's giant balloon, and I'm sure would have been curious to see it. But mine, which was just a shade smaller, was looked upon as just a runner-up. As I sailed away, August 15th, at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was amused to see that only four of my closest friends were on hand to see me off. I told them I wouldn't be up for a, I told them I would be up for a year. Well, that's the way I had planned it then. I waved goodbye and gave the command to let her go. And that is chapter three, folks. Hope you're excited. Uh, next, we'll do chapter four, The Unwelcome Passenger. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs>